webcasting from not mighty fine guitars webcasting from the secret subterranean lair where miss valerie and i dwell in daylight emerging only at night time i don't know what the hell i'm talking about how are you you hanging tough we're trying to hang tough oh i think the camera's a little crooked in that sorry kids no it looks good is that a little better all right it only gets so good hey there we are that's the uh that's the lair sure is and since I'm not at Mighty Fine Guitars today, well, you know, I have a little news about Mighty Fine Guitars today. Uh, do, when, when you pop on, say hello and let us know where you're webbing in from, because that's always of interest. That's always kind of cool to see where people are webbing in from. And by all means, tell us how you're doing. If you've got any comments or questions, all that stuff, please type them right in, because Miss Valerie is here. She's going to fire questions off over to me. I'll, I'll do the same. And in fact, I'm going to go check in and, and bop this over to the Mighty Fine Guitars page. Uh, Mighty Fine Guitars is still kind of up and rocking in certain respects. The shop, of course, is closed. But I was able to sell a guitar yesterday. We worked it all out, completely sanitary, staying, staying far apart. There was a little sleepover. The sleepover took. The fella decided to, to take the guitar, and uh, it was a beautiful match. Man, it's always great to sell a guitar, of course, and it's always great to buy a guitar. But... When it's a really great matchup, that's the best. And this was a froggy bottom guitar with an Adirondack top and uh, mahogany back and sides. It was really great. It was really, really great. <laughs> he loved it. It had spoken to him before, but he thought, does this guitar really speak to me the way I think it speaks to me? And sure enough, it did. So that, uh, that was great. He, he went, we did a little sleepover, sanitized everything. He took it back. If he had brought it back to the shop because it had not been love, I would have just taken the guitar, Lysoled off the outside, the case, real good, and let it sit for days on end, which would be no problem since most of those guitars are sitting and, uh, and doing nothing for days on end. Um, hang on just a sec here. Let me uh, try and talk and do this at the same time. Not easy for this boy. <laughs> Great shot there, Stevie, of me adjusting the, the screen. Um, that happens. Lessons are still happening online. And there are certain advantages, actually, to working online. Uh, working with real basic beginners is a little bit tough. And I'll go over a couple of things here that other, I think perhaps there'll be some teachers logging in here and students. And there's a little system I use that simplifies, thing, simplifies things, I think, quite a lot. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But guitars are getting sold. I'm going to be packing up a guitar sending it off to New York here pretty soon with a promise from the fellow on the other end that he will Lysol the outside of the box when he gets it or alcohol it down, let it sit for three days, do nothing with it just in case there are any little microbes inside, give them a chance to die off and then he can open the guitar. It probably shouldn't sit that long anyway. I always encourage people when they take delivery of guitars, let it sit in the box for a while, especially during the winter. And uh, because uh, the worst thing you can do for a guitar, and we've had it happen once, is ship a guitar off into cold climates. And I urged the fella, I insisted, he promised, and I think perhaps he forgot that he mustn't open the case right away. Because if it's been in a cold truck, in a cold, bigger truck, and in between in cold warehouses, and suddenly you open it up in a warm New York apartment, the finish on the top is likely just going to craze. It's going to go nuts and crack all over the place. You get that crackly looking stuff, which on old Martins arguably is sometimes kind of cool, but on new hand-built uh, guitars, not so very cool. Anyway, uh, this fella is going to take delivery of the guitar. Looks like if, if this all works out, uh, we'll sanitize everything on the outside, let everything sit long enough for uh, the microbes to die. He'll decide whether or not it's true love. If it is, he'll keep the guitar. I'll keep the money that he has sent me. He will have sent me. And uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. You know, If he sends it back, I'll do the same thing on this end. Take delivery of the thing. Lysol it off right away. Uh, Lysol spray, if you can get the concentrate, spray the thing down. It's really pungent, really smells nasty. But what else are you going to do? Uh, or a can of Lysol, if need be, a big rag soaked in alcohol, just kill those microbes on the outside. And I'm going to let it sit for indefinitely until somebody else expresses interest in that guitar. So that's going to be the system. Uh, lessons, minimal danger of microbe transmission has been my experience. 
uh, online. I'm using Zoom these days. Uh, I had never even heard of Zoom, not being a business business person. I hadn't heard of Zoom in forever until about two weeks ago. And now I have become fluent in Zoom, conversant at least in Zoom. I'm pretty fluent. And uh, also in FaceTime, uh, Facebook Messenger, which essentially I think is Skype. I'm not sure. We all use those little messenger windows, but a lot of people have not noticed that at the top of that window is a little video camera icon that uh, if you punch that, suddenly you're opening a, a chat invitation, a video chat invitation using whatever uh, uh, camera is on your device or on your laptop or your, your desktop. How about that? A lot of people do not know about that. So you're welcome. So Skype, Zoom, uh, FaceTime, and Facebook Messenger which is the least, perhaps the most popular, but the least desirable. I've found it to be the least stable platform for trying to conduct any sort of prolonged conversation. Um, for beginners, for raw beginners, it's a little tough because I have to, I can't be there to twist their fingers around into the desired shapes, you know, where, where they need to be, which is certainly desirable at the outset. But I've got a little system. You perhaps have heard of my little coil system. And the coil system is, I'll do this later, the coil system is, I named it myself. When you're talking about left-hand positions on the, on the guitar here, make sure that I'm in the picture. It looks like I am. I think we're okay. Good. Yes. When you're talking about left-hand positions here in a C chord, regular old C chord, I'd call that finger right there, I'd call that one 53, fifth string, third fret. String fret, string fret, string fret is the thing to remember. And I did that because it was kind of obnoxious. It might be a mnemonic you can use to remember. It's the string and then it's the fret. Two digits. The digit of the string and the digit of the fret. So that's a 53. That's a 5-3. That one is a 4-2 in a C chord. And that one up there is a 2-1, a 21. So I've got a 53, a 42, and a 21. Rather than talking about the C note or the E note or the C note, because if you're capoed, all those notes change. And right off the bat, I might not know what that note is, or that note, or that note. Rather than talking about the note itself, going with a relative to position to either the fingerboard, uh, fingerboard, either the nut or the capo, is kind of the way to go, I think. So here, that's a 21 in my C chord. If I'm capoed, six. I don't know what any of these notes are when I'm capoed six. I'd have to stop and kind of figure them out. But that, in a C shape, that's still a 21. That's still a 2-1. So, kind of a handy little system that I found works pretty good. Uh, I've seen people use the system saying this is an E, that would be a B1. Well, if you're in an alternate tuning, that's no longer a B string. And suddenly you have another layer of transposition to do in your mind. If you're in Dadgad, for instance, suddenly that's an A string. And this first fret is what? It's always that position against a capo or against a nut. That's always going to be a 21. So there you go. Use it or lose it, whatever you like. But uh, just an offering to, that might, you might find useful in taking or teaching guitar lessons. And yes, I'm teaching up a storm. I love it. I get to sit here with, uh, with my, my black sweats on, or in the summertime, I imagine I'll just paint my legs black. I don't even have to put pants on. I'm wearing pants today just for you folks. And uh, you're welcome. I also wanted to tell you, there have been uh, the same fellow that bought the guitar yesterday, that beautiful froggy bottom. Oh, it was gorgeous. If you get a chance, go to the website. It's uh, still up on the website there. But it's been sold. Click uh, MightyFunGuitars.com. Click just at the top. There. There's a whole list of builders up there. Click Froggy Bottom. And it's the one on the left that comes up of the three froggies that are up there. Two of them sold long ago. There's one on the left that's absolutely gorgeous with a sunburst, folded mahogany back and sides, and a stained uh, sunburst Adirondack top. And I think we have a question. Do you have any nationals or square neck trichome types? At the moment, no. I don't have any nationals or square neck trichomes. Thank you for the question. There is a dobro in there. Uh, or rather, there is a resonator guitar, lap style resonator guitar. Dobro is a brand name. We're not supposed to use it anymore. It's like, you know, you can't call a band aid a band aid or a Kleenex or a Kleenex or a Xerox a Xerox. Whoa, there's a song in there somewhere. I should write that shit down. Um, no, um, I don't have any nationals in at the moment or, uh, or square necked 
metal-bodied guitars, but there is a Dobro in there made by Crafters of Tennessee. That's a pretty screaming deal. Sounds great, and it's really pretty. I'm quite sure that's up on the website as well. Uh, yeah, check out the website again. Go to Crafters of Tennessee, punch the button. It should be pictures and details on the thing. It's pretty cool, and as I recall, it was right around $2,000. Pretty good deal for that guitar. Crafters of Tennessee. Tut Taylor was behind that operation, if, if memory serves. I may be wrong on that, but I think Tut Taylor was in that picture somehow. Any other questions or comments? We're okay? Oh. Oh, the painting. <laughs> I should show you this painting. Check this out. That's by Randy Chavez, dear friend of mine from college. And it's, uh, it's a giant clown. And I'm afraid I've got a tripod kind of right in the middle here that's, uh, that's uh, kind of blocking the view of, of perhaps some of it. But I'll, I'll free that up some. Or I'll post a picture of the, uh, of the painting itself. That was done for... Uh, Randy's a wonderful painter. It's a giant clown. It's probably a bit tough to see with all the backlight I've got going on at the moment. It's a giant clown about to pound a steak uh, kind of back in the backyard of a, of a circus somewhere. He's about to pound down on a steak and uh, this, there's a, a fellow over here whose thumb has gotten hit by the previous strike. And this was used as a uh, as the poster image for a Blues Traveler concert I forget, maybe the Fillmore years ago? Randy's done a lot. Randy Chavez, uh, wow. He's done a lot of posters for rock shows over the years, and especially for Bill Graham Productions in, in that era. <clears throat> Still a fantastic illustrator and painter and a dear friend from college. We, we go way back, if you'll pardon the expression. Well, uh, with that in mind, that's the painting, and I'll, I'll block part of it again here. Where was I going? Where was I? Nationals, thank you. Crafters of Tennessee is the brand name of the Dobro that I have in. Lap style resonator guitar. Uh, square nut guitars, for those of you that aren't savvy, and I imagine this is a pretty savvy crowd that turns up here, but if, you're, if you haven't run across this yet, let me hip you to the scene. Uh, resonator guitars, uh, instead of just having a hollow box, have inside them either a single or three or more sometimes, little spun resonator cones that act as mechanical uh, not only amplifiers but speakers. It's sort of like taking that old speaker from the from your your big old stereo system that you had in college. Turn that instead of having paper or fiber of some kind, plastic of some kind as the medium for the speaker itself. Turn that into really thin spun aluminum, and that becomes a, a, a volumizer that really cranks up the volume and gives you that kind of banjoid tone as well. The uh, uh, resonator guitars came along just before electricity hit the guitar scene and kind of subsumed the whole scene for the longest time. And if you want to take a trip <laughs> down a rabbit hole, check out the, uh, the Byzantine history of the National and Dobro corporations. Dobro was the name concocted by the Dopiera brothers, Dobro. And then there was the National Company and back and forth, and then National was resuscitated recently here in, in Central California. And that's quite a trip. That's quite a trip down, uh, down the historical roads to see what happened with those two companies. Still really fine guitars. And you know, I had a, uh, a lap style resonator myself. I had a, a National, a Style two, not terribly fancy, but it had some engraving on it, a style two um, from 1929, and it was fantastic. But I just wasn't using it. I was on the road at the time for years on end, and I thought, I'm bogarting this guitar. That's bad juju. That's bad karma. I'm going to pass this along to somebody who can actually use it. So I did. And boy, one of these days, I'm keeping my eye out. Good Lord willing, the creek don't rise. I'd love to have. A, you got a style two out there, anybody? From 1929? I'd love it. That was a great guitar although it was so damn loud. I think it probably did not help my tinnitus too much at all, having that thing ringing right up at you. It was really, really loud, but what a sweet, lovely tone. Yes, more questions. What was the pur purpose of the square neck? The square neck was uh, primarily because since you didn't need to wrap your hand around it, you're gonna play it strictly on the lap, this way. You didn't need to have um, a round neck. Also, 
it made your angles a little better because the guitar would flatten out on your on your lap instead of tipping this way. This was kind of the problem with those big old dreadnought uh, uh, Martins that a lot of those old guys, Sal O.P., you see him playing with uh, Tao Moe, all those old guys, played with guitars with really thick bodies, and the guitar would lap like this, so you'd have to have one leg up. So having a square neck would help with that. It also makes the guitar much more stable, because often you have a lot of string pressure on there. You can tune those bad boys up pretty high. So I had an E6 tuning on mine, which was really odd. I walked into Griffin one day, 25 years ago? We don't need to know. Don't ask. I walked into Griffin, and the thing was right over the door. I turned around. One of the guys said, look what you just walked under. It just came in. And it was this beautiful, it was in fantastic shape. I thought it was new. Beautiful, all metal-bodied, nickel-silver, uh, style two, national guitar, square neck. And it was quite remarkable. And it was in this tuning that was uh, an E... What was that? It was an E13, essentially. Whoever asked that question, write this down. Because this, if you're messing around with national guitars, uh, write this down. This might be a tuning that would be of interest to you. The low string was an E. Then you had to adjust this one, gauge-wise, because you'd never get to it with a regular A string. This was an E. This was a D. This was another E. This was a G sharp. This was a C sharp. And that was an E. So the one string you'd not be able to get to with a standard sort of guitar string set would be this uh, this low D string that you'd have down here. You had E, D, E, which was very strange. But what it let you do, you could play... Wow, we're, <laughs> we're getting into deep esoterica here. I hope we're not losing too many folks here. I'll get to that question in just a sec there. This is... It gave you, essentially... Well, I can't even reach it on the guitar here. It gave you... So down low there, it gave you a dominant 7 chord. It gave you two E's and a D, so it gave you that sort of pendant sound that you're just about to move along to another chord somehow. And up top here, it gave you a 6, which is that really typey Hawaiian sort of sound. So it gave you this E6 sound, but with, with one of those in there. super cool and super useful because you could play not only major key sounding stuff like this, you could play minor key sounding stuff as well. It was pretty trippy. On a straight bar. You could play all that on a straight bar. All right. Back to the world of wooden guitars. Well, I think we have another question. John Mooney wants to know the neck is not hollow in those. Oh, John Mooney. Hi there. Another great college pal. You remember Randy Chavez? Yeah? Maybe not. He, does. he, he was does. only there for a year. Does he? Yeah. Um, John Mooney, the neck on some of those guitars was hollow. Typically, uh, typically it was it was wood clad in metal, but uh, some of them, including some of the the wooden necked guitars rather than the metal necked guitars, uh, were hollow as well. Some of those guitars, I'll do a whole thing next week. In fact, I'll bust out my my uh, uh, lap style guitar. I have a Weisenborn esque guitar that I'll show you next week, and we'll get into the weeds even deeper on this stuff. And I'll play a little tune that I wrote for, for Weisenborn. We'll get to that next week. Stay tuned. I guess I'm doing these things on Fridays. I guess I'm doing these things, even though I'm not at the shop. But we can talk about guitars. We can nerd out. We can go down these little rabbit holes, these little vole holes, because they're not too big. Uh, any other questions or comments happening? We're okay? Good, good. Feel free to fire them in. And like I say, if you don't know, if this is your first time visiting here, these videos persist. They stay up here on Facebook, who has unlimited storage, clearly. There are uh, Friday Noontime Facebook webcasts, FNFWs, going back a couple, three years now. Uh, and I'm going through all of them, trying to retitle them, put dates on them, and then pull them down from Facebook and send them back up to YouTube, where even more people live. Uh, speaking of that, um, uh, I've been doing these noontime, oh, I've been doing these noontime, I have been doing these noontime webcasts. I'm also doing webcasts, playing just music, not nerding out on guitars, on Monday nights at 7.30. The first one was at 7 o'clock, but there were complaints because that's Jeopardy time. So we moved it to 7.30, Monday nights at 7.30, a webcast on Facebook, just on either this page or the Stevie Coyle music page. Uh, 
I'm also doing webcasts, though, on a platform called Stageit, S-T-A-G-E-I-T dot com, Stageit dot com. And I'm going to be doing those on Monday nights, at uh, on, on Friday nights, rather. Sorry, Facebook is Mondays, Stageit's are Fridays. Friday nights at 6 o'clock to accommodate those sleepy heads, those early to bed, early to rise, makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise, people on the East Coast who find uh, 1030 night a little too late for them. You old people, piss me off, man. There's, uh, but well, that'll be 9 o'clock your time. All the other times in between, and I don't know how those go, I've never figured out, and I only knew, knew it when I needed to know it, when I was crossing time zones touring, how mountain goes, mountain doesn't go on, daylight saving, is that right? Or central? On the, everything happens first in New York, which is why I watch the news to see what's going on uh, in New York, so that I, I'm ahead of the game here. Yes, more questions. Two questions. Sure, two of them. Rocco Giovanni picked up a beautiful Pono parlor from Hawaii. Ever heard of one? A Pono parlor? Rocco, if you get a chance on this thread, post a picture of it. I'm not savvy to Pono parlors, but a little one, kind of a real life parlor, really small, smaller than an O. Rocco Tavani, hello. Rocco, I gotta tell a story on you. Rocco sent me on this path, inadvertently, but he sent me on the path I've been on all these years because my folks bought from him through Gadsby's Music in Salinas, California. They bought for me the guitar that he was selling, which was a 1967 Martin D18. Serial number 232192, if memory serves. And I'm still looking for it out there, just, you know, on the, on the webs to see if it's out there. Rocco consigned it to Gadsby's. My folks bought it for me because when I was a junior in high school, for my birthday or Christmas, Christmas I think it was, and that was the first really good guitar that we had in the household. <clears throat> my brother Jamie and I had some pretty good guitars. Um, Jamie had a pretty good guitar. I was struggling along, <clears throat> excuse me, with a, uh, with a, a Stella guitar, one of those ones that was Masonite on the inside. You could do this, reach inside, and you could feel the fuzzy side of the Masonite. Not a great guitar. Action like this, spray painted on, markers, fantastic. Spray painted wood grain, sunburst on the top. Remarkable spray painting art piece. Not much in the way of guitar. But that Martin, Rocco, thank you for consigning it to, to Gadsby's and for, uh, for, and my folks picked it up and I've, I wish to God I had never had to sell that guitar, but to move along, we do. We sell the guitars that we have to get better, presumably better guitars, but then you think, oh, there's that one that got away. We all got one that got away stories. Feel free to post yours, because we all got them. Thanks, Rocco. I don't know Pono, but uh, do you play it in alternate tunings? Do you do slack key stuff on it? And if you get a chance, post a picture of it. I'd love to see it. Thanks, Rocco. There's nothing stopping you from bringing your guitar to home to continue showing guitar. Do you know, I suppose I could bring guitars home. Uh, space is at a premium here. We don't live in a real big place. Um, I might do that, although there's the, the consideration of microbe transmission, I suppose, between here and there. Um, not sure exactly how, how fraught to be about that, but probably pretty fraught. And uh, getting cases out, packing up guitars, you know, that guitar, going back to the shop, I'd be Lysoling it again. And Lysol smells really, really bad. Just the case. But if there's, just the case, yes, yes, <laughs> just the case. <laughs> Not the guitar. The guitar I would leave in the case and frozen. That guitar would be frozen for a certain length of time, uh, unplayed, left alone by itself for however long to let the microbes inside the case die from lack of uh, having a proper host. So that, that is a possibility and I will consider that, but I haven't really thought that through and I really want to think it through before I put anybody, including us, is in danger in any way. So yeah, good question, thanks. How, yes? long, how long does the virus stay on an ebony fingerboard? Do you know, I don't know how long a virus stays on an ebony fingerboard. The word I've heard, and this is why, I don't take this as gospel, I don't know what I'm talking about, but what I've heard is that in most cases, aside from really hard surfaces like, not even like ebony, but like stainless steel, many times harder than ebony, um, the frets, I suppose, there's that, isn't there? Stainless steel frets, if they were. I hear that the virus can last long times. So what do we know? Three days, we think? 
three days seems to be the figure that's floating around out there. But I would check that out, and I will check that out with the WHO and the CDCs. Um, that's, um, that's the way to go, I think. There's lots of information floating around. My uncle knows this epidemiologist that worked at Stanford back in the 50s, and he says, nah, nah, I'm going to go with the WHO or the CDC, and uh, certainly not what's getting transmitted from Washington, D.C. every day. That seems to be less than reliable information. Can I put it blandly, mildly for you? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Are we pretty well caught up there? All right. I wanted to tell you about all of that. Speaking of fingerboards, uh, ebony fingerboards, I wanted to mention there's a gentleman on Facebook called Brian Kohlner, K-O-L-N-E-R, no umlauts, I don't think, K-O-L-N-E-R, really cool dude, really great 12-string uh, player, who posted in the Bojo guitar lovers section, and maybe on his own page as well, um, instructions and his technique for oiling fingerboards. And this, you know, while we're all hanging around the house, this is a great time to do that kind of thing, you know. And he shows you how to do it safely, sanely, how little to use, which is really important. It's a great little tutorial. Brian Kohlner, K-O-L-N-E-R. Either friend him up or send him a note and see if he won't hip you to, or just jump right on over to the Bozo, B-O-Z-O, Guitar Lovers page. I think I've got the title slightly wrong, but that might be, it's something like that. And you'll see not too far down the crawl, a post by Brian Kohlner, Kohlner, yeah, um, about oiling your fingerboard, which is probably a good idea, especially you folks back east. Out here on the west coast, wait a minute, no, no, I speak for myself. I'm probably greasy enough and play all over the fingerboard enough to where I don't have too much of trouble with the fingerboard drying out. But we all could keep our fingerboards cleaner, that's for sure. And the gridoo that builds up kind of right next to your frets, it's not pretty. It's not sexy, no. Fix it. And this is a good opportunity to do that. Um, what else did I want to tell you? I made a little list here and everything. Uh, shipping. Oh, the pa I'm t in the finger style lessons, just as a little teaser and something you might be able to, to use, if, you're, if you find yourself doing the pattern that we all do, <laughs> Pattern pick five three four two five three four two five three four two five three four two. Just going to give you a little hint here. The hint is that there's a pattern within the pattern. Check it out. We're also used to keeping visuals going on the left hand, on the, on the fingering hand. Sorry, lefties, I'm being parochial. Sorry, you sinister people. On the on the fretting hand, we're also used to watching that, keeping an eyeball on that. Well, I'd suggest keep an eyeball on your right hand as well, on your picking hand as well. And notice that the pattern within the pattern is this. And on top of this, you can put anything. You got a little tab paper, tap yourself out some of this sometime, even just in a C chord. A 53 and a 42 and a 53 and a 42 and a 53 and a 42. And a 53 and a 42. Just two of each in every measure. Two 53s, two 42s in a measure. Call that a measure. That's because that's four beats. One, two, three, some of you are way past this, but some of you may not be, and this may be a new way to think about stuff that you knew, but you didn't know this way. This is the pattern that lives within that pattern, the little pattern we all use for landslide and for the boxer, which is slightly different, but it's uh, uh, eight miles high. Um, dust in the wind, that little patterny thing we all do. There's a pattern within the pattern, and I'm getting to the point I really am, and I do have one. And that is that the pattern within the pattern is this thumb going back and forth. Now, on top of that, you can put anything. Let me hum a little melody I'll just make up in my head. Da, 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 All bendy fingers. All just the only thing you have to do now is figure. I have to do is figure out what da 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 is on the fingerboard. Da lives up there. Da 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 da. Oh, not too bad. Thirteen, eleven, ten, twenty-one. I 
put that on top of the grid that I have in my mind of this. Tommy Emanuel famously asked, how do you do that? He says, you gotta wrangle this fella. This is a very disobedient digit. You gotta wrangle this fella and get him to just do this. He said, do this and do this and do this. Do this a ton. Do this until the dog gets up and leaves in disgust. At just about the time your spouse is about to leave you, that's about time to add in the fingers. And then we add in the fingers. But this is really the heart and soul of this whole thing. Da, 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 da. I'm right on the beat there, aren't I? Da, 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 da. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That means when I'm on the beat like that, one, two, three, four, that these are all going to be pinches that happen over here. Da. There's the first one. Pinch with the low bass note. Now I know I'm going to have to play the high bass note next. That's a given, because you, you never play this in this scheme. You never play the same bass note twice. Da, da. A little sour by itself, but I'm hoping that once I speed this up, it's going to sound OK. Having an E note here and an F note there, kind of kind of oogie, but only oogie slow. I'm quite sure that that's going to be okay once I speed the thing up and get it up to tempo. The next bass note I'm playing is back to 53 because I just played my 42. That's all I got in the bass is 53s and 42s. I go back to that 53. There's my next melody note. My melody notes on that high string are a third fret, first fret, open, da, my 21 there, the mighty C note root of this whole thing. It ain't Bach, but it ain't bad. Boy, ain't that, ain't Bach. That really ain't Bach, no how. But that's the principle. That's kind of what happens there. Wonderful guitar player that we went to see years ago. Remember Doug McLeod? We went to see over at Eric Schoenberg's shop. Great shop in Tiburon. We went to see this performer called Doug McLeod, a wonderful Piedmont-style blues player. And somebody from the assembled crowd, we were all right on top of them. You know, it was a little teeny shop, you know, and 40 of us crowded in there, crammed in and folding chairs and just digging it. And somebody said, Doug, how do you do that? He said, how do I do that? How do I do thumb picking? I'll show you how I do thumb picking. Well, I just, I wish I could do his accent, beautiful New Orleans sort of accent as I recall. And his shoes. Man, Doug McLeod has the best shoes. You gotta dress better than your audience, was his advice to me. I said, Doug, you got any advice? He said, yeah, just dress better than your audience, so. <laughs> he said, just get two bass notes going back and forth. That's all I do is get two bass notes going back and forth, and then anything else I play up top there can only be one of two things. And I started freezing up already. And Valerie reached over and put her hand on me and said, wait, wait, let him talk. Don't stand up and shout yet. I said, uh, and he said, anything I do on top of this can only be one of two things. It can only be a pinch, a note that happens at the same time as one of those bass notes. Or it can be a note that happens between two bass notes. I thought that is absolutely correct. In this scheme, for most of us, for 90% of the time, this is true. Once you get this grid going, one more piece of advice, these things don't stay in tune by themselves overnight. So don't do what Stevie just did and pick it up and play it untuned. But there you go, there's the principle of all of that stuff, and that's all I'm showing you. The rest, I'm not gonna, you can't, uh, what's about the thing about buying the cow when the milk is free? Something like that. But if I can help with guitar lessons, let me know. Zoom is the preferred platform at the moment. If you're not hip to Zoom, <laughs> it's not like we're gonna be flooding, you know, uh, whoever runs that outfit with too many requests, but Zoom is the premier platform, because we can exchange images online at the same time get a little whiteboard i can draw out little charts for you and stuff totally cool stevie at steviecoil.com or through facebook here get in touch let's do some lessons let's make productive use of this time that we all have 
in our own little subterranean lairs. Yes, another question. That joke's pigs and sausages. Oh, pigs and sausages, maybe. Maybe that was it. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. Man, milk and pigs and sausages. And, wow. Mm, cows? Sure. Um, I think that's all I got for you today. Is that right? Oh, and the webcast tonight um, on stageit.com cost you $3.50 to get in. But the best part is it's only a half hour show. So it doesn't hurt too much for too long. $3.50 gets you in the door. You got to go to the site first, though, stageit.com. Plug in my name uh, in the little search box, and I'll pop right up there with tonight's show. You have to buy in advance uh, using credit card or PayPal or something or other. Um, notes. They call their mechanism of exchange over their notes, and a note is 10 cents. And you'll have to buy at least 35 notes to get into the show tonight. But it's a pretty hip uh, performing platform. They, they have their stuff together. The picture quality and sound are usually really pretty good. And uh, we'll have a lot of fun. I'll just do a quick little half hour set and get you on your way. Certainly won't get in the way of Jeopardy at seven. Plenty of time to, can't do that, good heavens. And then uh, on Monday night, I'll see you here on Facebook if you like, do a whole new set from, from the last time. I'll, I'll, I had a couple of requests that I'm gonna buff up in the meantime and see what I can do. So great to see you. Last, no, no questions, no comments? Do we have anybody logging in from Antarctica or anything like that? Uh, maybe. Really? Maybe. Yeah. Somebody did make a comment a while back. There was a comment. Uh, and if guitars, my guitar, if guitars cannot be transported, why bother? I'm not sure what he meant. Oh, um, Mike, I'm not sure that guitars uh, can't be transported. I have to look up and see what's going on in the shipping world. But uh, certainly guitars, if the person lives close enough here, we can do a, a kind of a an exchange in the parking lot that, that I did yesterday to keep everybody safe and germ free with lots of alcohol and sanitizers and gloves and masks and all the rest. Shipping guitars I think is not going to be a problem um, so long as the receiver splashes down the outside of the box with alcohol or Lysol first, lets it sit for three days. This would be all after we exchange dollars, you know, immediately refundable dollars. Mike Tatarakis, thanks for asking. After dollars are exchanged, the shipping can happen. The receiver would have to leave the guitar in the box, Xerox, oh, Xerox, <laughs> Lysol, wow, what a strange transposition. Would have to leave the guitar in the box, sanitized box, for three days to let those microbes die. Then open the thing up, Try it out. If it's love, you keep the guitar and I keep the money. That's great. If it's not, I refund the money when I receive the guitar back. It sits in the case for, uh, sits in the box that I will have Lysoled off for three days. Uh, plus, I'd open it up, make sure everything's okay, refund the money. So, a bit clumsy, a bit clunky, a bit of a kludge. Um, a new word for me. But uh, it can be done. It can be done. That's, that's the way. No international shipping, of course, of uh, Brazilian rosewood. That's been the case for the longest time. But anything else, I think, is workable. Clumsy, a bit awkward, but workable. Sure thing. And there's some fantastic stuff in the shop. And updates going up on the website really soon, so stay tuned. In fact, today I'll be working in my non-lesson hours uh, on getting the website buffed up a bit. So there's the word. Thank you very much. We all set? I think we're all set. All right. Uh, have some milk and sausages. Don't know what that means. <clears throat> Sounds dirty. Well, thank you for tuning in, everybody. Stevie Coyle here at uh, Normally at Mighty Fine Guitars. Not normally, but usually, I suppose, is the better turn of phrase. Beat you to it at uh, Mighty Fine Guitars, but here from the secret, secret subterranean lair in Larkspur, oh, Larkspur, in Lafayette, California, L cities. Confuse me, apparently. I did this before. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, stay safe. Send a good vibe to John Prine if you got one to spare, and uh, all the other folks. Uh, uh, we lo lost uh, Bucky Pizzarelli yesterday to COVID-19. Good, keep the good vibes going out, and uh, we'll see you down the line. Very good, folks. Ta-ta.